two tonight. Um, we kind of got into chapter two a little bit last week, but we're going to uh, continue through the chapter tonight. Um, the, 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 there's a change here as we get into chapter two, verse, uh, what is it, four. Uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the change that you notice? Well, what was chapter one about? Well, so a warning to uh, Israel's neighbors. Okay. Is going to happen to them. Okay, judgment and 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 God uh, uh, making a case against them. Right, he's he's coming uh, against them with a, a, a almost a legal kind of proceeding. Um, so what changes then in chapter in verse four of chapter two? Uh, the focus now will be on Israel. <laughs> yeah. So Your problems now the focus has changed from from the nations around uh, the land of Israel to uh, the two kingdoms that, that make up God's chosen people. Right, the, the northern kingdom and the, the, of, of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. Since Amos is basically going to the northern kingdom of Israel, um, it, it's sort of like the, the prophecy is zeroing in, sort of spiraling in, and, uh, and, and so Amos will first talk about Judah's sins. That's going to come first in, in chapter 2, verse 4, and then he's going to turn his attention to Israel, and you'll be able to tell almost immediately that, uh, that that's what his focus was intended to be because um, there's a uh, uh, because there's a lot more related to uh, to Israel than uh, than to anybody else. Um, did anybody have a problem connecting tonight? Yeah. No. I did for a second there. That's why I'm late. And May says oh. she's having a, May says she's having a problem here. What I did, I just come out and I just started over again because it kept asking me the same question over and over again about incorrect um, passwords and stuff. All right. I'm going to tell her to go out and try again. <clears throat> uh, okay. So things change as we get to verse four. Now we're talking about Judah. Um it's not just the Gentiles who are under God's judgment. And we're going to see a real difference here in the, in the things that, that God says to Judah and especially to Israel compared to what he said to these nations around them. Um, we pointed out last week that, that the, the, the condemnations, the charges against the nations around Israel basically revolved around what? Uh the unnecessarily uh, cruel uh, and brutal uh, tactics that they used in, um, in war. But now with uh, Judah and Israel, um, God is talking about things <clears throat> that they have done against, uh, against him, uh, things that, that they have uh, in the, I guess, uh, things in the law that they have uh, ignored. Right. It, yeah, it changes. We're, we're, not, we're not any more concerned about, or, or we're not so concerned about the, the harshness and the cruelty that these nations have shown against one another in, in wartime in particular, uh, but both Judah and Israel, and especially Israel, are going to be held accountable for, uh, for violations of God's law that he's revealed to them. Um, there's going to be a higher standard, in other words, right? Uh, God is holding Judah and Israel to a higher standard because he's revealed himself to them more fully than he has to the other nations. Uh, with the other nations, it seems like probably what's, what they're being held to account for is kind of just human moral 
a, a, a moral compass that was probably prevalent among all the nations of the ancient Near East, things that they would all agree on at mo in most times that were, were cruel or, or harsh. Um, and, and, and so these nations are basically being held account to account for that. Uh, the changes with Judah and with, with Israel. So with Judah's sins, um, if somebody, if you would, read uh, verses uh, 4 and 5 of Amos 2. This is what, this the, Lord... Is what the Lord says. No, go ahead. Go on, Josh. This is what the Lord says. For three sons of Judah, even for four, I will not relent. Because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his decrees, because they have been led astray by false gods, the gods of their, their ancestors followed, I will send fire on Judah that will consume the fortresses of Jerusalem. So the, the, the pattern, I'm sorry. So the pattern remains the same, right? The pattern remains for three sins of blank, even for four, I'll hold them accountable. I, 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 you know, I, I won't relent in my, in my judgment. And then the reason, one reason usually given, and then I'll send fire that will consume the fortresses. That's all we've seen all that before, almost word for word. And Judah fits that pattern. Um, the three sins, the, the, the four, three sins, uh, even for four formula uh, has not been fulfilled yet in any of these, in any of these prophecies. It's just usually just one, maybe two, depending on how you might split a couple of them. But, but there's not the, the three or four sins that you'd expect when you see that kind of formula, say, in, in Proverbs. Um, so so uh, it, it sort of gives the impression that, yeah, there's sin here that we need to deal with, but not to its full uh, amount. Uh, when we get to Israel, things are going to change. Um, so why is, why is God, what does he have against Judah? They ignored him, and they knew the laws that okay. he had, uh, revealed to them. They have rejected the law. They have not kept his decrees. Right. That's parallelism. It probably means mostly the same thing, the law and the decrees. Maybe there's a little slightly slight nuance and difference, but generally it means the same thing. God, they have rejected God's revelation. They've rejected God's uh, law. They don't keep it. They don't obey it. Um, why not? What for, either, either it's either what form it takes or why they don't obey it. Uh, what's the reason or what's what form is the is the disobedience taken? Well, it's, it says that they've gone. They've gone back to the gods of their ancestors <laughs> after having um, seen what God did for them and uh, then the, having the law that God gave them, uh, they've allowed themselves for whatever reason to um, go back to those um, other gods. Right, right. Uh, the the uh, false gods. The NIV says false gods. Actually, the uh, interestingly, the Hebrew just says lies. They they followed lies. Uh, it doesn't even specify false gods. That's sort of an interpretational move, and it's probably a good one. But it, it, the, the the literal word is lies. Um, you know, false false gods. Every false god is based on a lie, right? Whatever it is, whatever whatever it is we're worshiping. If it's if it's a false god, it's based on on the law on, on a lie at least one lie probably numerous lies think about our our study of truth uh that we we just got through with, right talking about you know how, where do we find reality where, where do we find what's true and something that we can kind of put our lives uh, uh, bedrock for our lives uh, where do we find that how do we know what's true and we we kept coming back to scripture says we, we come back to God we come back to his revelation that's how we know what truth is always uh, lost gods though are based on on different kinds of lies they'll tell you what you want to hear <laughs> they'll promise that what you want to happen will happen that's that's what a false god does because 
false gods and, and, and serving false gods are really about trying to control our lives, control the world around us, making sure that everything goes as we want it to go. If you go back to pagan culture, that's what they were doing, right? Yeah. Um, they're appeasing these gods to make sure that the, the harvest is plentiful, that the, the you know, floods miss them, that, you know, whatever, that they're, they're, the, the, the foreign armies don't come. They're trying to appease these gods to keep these things from happening or, or make sure the good things happen. And it's still the same. False gods are still about, I want, I want some things to happen. So how do I make sure that happens? I want to control my life and my world. I want to make sure that everything falls out good for me and, and, um, and mine. That's, that's what false gods are about. And so, uh, so you see that here. Um, and yeah, these are the gods that their ancestors followed. Um, this is ancestral. This is inherited behavior. Uh, they've gone back to these false gods that, that, Seemingly, they were generations removed from, but it doesn't take much to go back to them. In some cases, um, <clears throat> though, the, the Israelites, uh, they intermarried with uh, people from that uh, land because it, it, it wasn't completely conquered. So there, there were some um, <clears throat> other uh, tribes or whoever uh, living it, and they they married women from from those tribes and that in those cases sometimes the um, the men were led astray by their their wives and and what they believed. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those, those the kings were there. What's that? Led astray. The kings. You know. Yeah. I, well, I don't know if. Uh, there's like Ahab and, and you know, kings like that. They were led astray by, by their wives. Oh, Solomon, famously, right? Solomon, sure. yes. Solomon famously yes. was, um, in latter years particularly, was led away from the, the wisdom of, of God and, and um, served, served pagan gods. I mean, it's it's a temptation. It's a, it's it's always something we have to be vigilant about. That that we we follow God and we follow uh, God because we believe that He is the, the only God and the true God. Uh, we believe because He's revealed Himself to us through Jesus. But there's, I mean, there there are a lot of lies, <laughs> and there are a lot of of reasons to to go after these these false these false gods uh, just just because we don't have idols so much in our world anymore and and just because we don't you know make images of of, of gods and serve them in temples doesn't mean that there's not they're not false gods guilty of that at times too oh yes. i always i always uh Remember the the screw tape letters. If you've ever read the screw tape letters, the the the, the whole idea behind you know at one point, um, screw tape uh, takes his nephew Wormwood to task because he's been too obvious in his temptation, and so he's you know he's like you know don't don't come. He's basically he says you know don't don't come at him in, you know in his face. You know you you come around the side. You 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 whisper in his ear. You. You, you tempt him by with ego or with security or, you know, you, 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 you tempt him in these sort of subtle ways. Uh, you know, he, he said, basically, this isn't the time to, uh, to, to come at people in their face. You, 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 you trick them, you deceive them. Um, I mean, it is, it's, it's a, an insightful, I, I think, uh, little book about how, how we get drawn away from God and, and how we get drawn to these other, these other things. Not meaning to, not intending to, uh, but the lies, we believe the lies. And so we, uh, we find ourselves following these, these false gods that we thought we were, we were over. <clears throat> 
So, I'll send fire on Judah that will consume the fortresses of Jerusalem. And that's, of course, what happens about 150 years after this. Um, that's what happens to Jerusalem when battle uh, besieges them and eventually um, starves and burns them out. Um, <clears throat> So then verse six, this is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. Now, count them up. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground, and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. And they lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God, they drink wine taken as fines. There is the four. This is the first time we've, we've seen it in these two chapters. Uh, the three sins of Israel, even for four. And now, now God actually has four sins. I'm sure he could have come up with four sins against the other nations as well. But rhetorically, it works really well. Because the point is... Well, what? What's the point by doing it that way? What's the point with, with listing these four sins where with the other nations you've only listed one or maybe two? What do you think he's doing with that? I think he's pointing out that these are all abominations to God. Yeah. He hates them. Can't stand them. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the list is full, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they have... Israel has Israel has filled up their sin quota. Israel has has checked all the boxes, and and so all that's left now is is God's judgment on them. Um, so, um, these these sins that as as Dan puts it puts it are abominations. First, they sell the innocent for silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals. So really. Um, yeah, pretty low uh, image, isn't it? What, 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 what's the, what's the idea there? What do you think it's conveying? Human trafficking. I'm sorry. Human trafficking, possibly. Well, I mean, perhaps to some degree, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it has to do probably with, uh, with, with the idea of, of uh, if you were in debt in ancient Israel, you could go and. And work off your debt to your fellow Israelite, but there were laws about it. It was something that was allowed, something that was, you know, that was sort of just a reality in in the world, where you know, if you had nothing and no way to pay your debts and no way to pay your bills and have put food on your table, you could go work for somebody to to be sort of a hired indentured servant. Um, but that was what you were. Um, in Leviticus 25, uh, 39 through 43, it talks about, it gives sort of some guidelines about this. You could sell yourself to your brother Israelite, but explicitly it says you are not to treat them as slaves. They are hire, hired workers who are only under obligation until the day of Jubilee. The day of Jubilee is, of course, that every 50 years where all the debts are forgiven and all the land reverts to uh, the, the families that own it, and, and you kind of hit a big reset economically uh, in Israel. Um, and, and so uh, at that day, on that day, those, those servants were to go free. Um, it's interesting in that text, it says God, it says essentially God doesn't treat Israel as slaves, but servants. So you should treat one another, not as slaves, but servants. So it, it's a, an economic practice that's that's uh, anchored in God's treatment of Israel. This is this is the way God's treated you. So you've got to treat one another this way. Um, sell the innocent for silver, the needy for a pair. I mean, it, it didn't even take much, right? Just a, a, a penance, just a small debt, and they were, you know, apparently sort of putting each other into essentially slavery. We, I think last week we kind of talked about how um, Israel's neighbors in chapter one um, 
their sins are all um, things that they do to outsiders. Yeah. Um, versus Israel uh, and God's, you know, very concerned about their treatment of each other. I, the effect of it, um, I don't know whether God and Amos intended it this way or not, but the effect is that <clears throat> it, saying that, you know, you, you, you Israelites treat each other the way that these other, um, that the pagans treat um, their enemies in war, um, which is very striking image um, and doesn't reflect well on Israel at all. Well, we, we had that. We did see that in, in, in uh, the nation who were. Uh, okay. Who were, uh, Sorry, guys. It's all right. Who were treating each other. Uh, with, um, you know, who, who were, were basically going to war against one another and then taking prisoners and, and selling them into slavery, uh, making a profit off it. Israel isn't exactly doing the same thing, but they are in essentially, sell, in, a, in essence, selling one another uh, to each other for, for, uh, for these, these purposes. So yeah, it is. It's striking that to, to treat one another, brother and sister Israelites, uh, the way that, that these other nations were treating treating their enemies. It's worse, really, right? And it sounds worse. So that's going on. Number two, they trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Deuteronomy 16, 19 says, do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the innocent. Follow justice and justice alone, so that you may live and possess the land the Lord your God is giving you. The, 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 it's interesting, isn't it, that tied to the promise of the land is the agreement that we will treat each other with justice. God says, essentially, if I'm giving you this land, then here's the way you're going to live in it. You're going to live in it showing justice to one another. And you're not going to let those who can afford to pervert justice do so. The assumption, I think, is as long as there are people who have the means to pervert justice, <laughs> they will try to. <laughs> and 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 the, 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 the prohibition, and there's a very strong prohibition against that tied to whether you get to stay in the land or not. You, the implication is if you don't do this, if you don't treat one another this way, there's not a place for you here. Um, plenty of Old Testament texts, right, that talk about this kind of thing, talk about justice, the need for justice. Uh, we tend to think of justice as punitive, I think. We tend to sort of use it in the context of, you know, well, uh, you know, this, this person who killed someone got life in prison. That's, that's justice, you know, we, we call it. But, but, and there is a kind of punitive justice in Scripture sometimes. But the idea of, of justice, <laughs> uh, the intent of justice is if, if you live, if you create as a society a just world, then you don't need the punitive justice, right? Because everybody's already giving, you know, behaving rightly toward one another. And, and so I, that's what we're, we're, we're dealing with here. You can't, you, you can't let bribes sway your decision. You can't let the wealth of, of, of those who have, have means sway your decisions in, in justice. Who's, ba who's making the calls in Israel, in, in ancient Israel, as, as the law is given to these, these wandering uh, uh, expatriates, these wandering uh, 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 fugitives, sort of? Uh, who, who's, who's making decisions? Who, who are the ones that are, are making sure justice happens? Who did you go to in ancient Israel, wandering through the desert, or even as you got into the promised land? Who did you go to with your, with your concerns, with your cases, with your worries, with your problems, with your disputes? Who did you go to? When they were wanted, they went to Moses, didn't they? And they did at first. <laughs> later, there were, there were people called judges. Um, 
and I, I don't know that they were officially appointed, but maybe like, you know, like the village elders or something that they would go to them and, and present their case. And I suppose they figured those, these men knew the scriptures and knew you know, what God wanted. And so then they would make the decision based on that. Absolutely. You, you go to the elders, you go to the, 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 the people who are sort of acknowledged as, as leaders in a, in a village or in an area. You go to them and you uh, remember uh, one that comes to mind is Deborah, who sat under a tree uh, making decisions, right? Giving, giving verdicts. People would come to Deborah with their problems. They'd come to Deborah with their struggles and Deborah would, would help work them through it with, with justice, uh, with righteousness. So that's kind of the way it worked, right? I mean, that, that, think of um, Jesus tells a parable about an unjust judge, right? Uh, the, the, the woman keeps coming to him, the, the widow keeps coming to him uh, to get justice against her adversary. Somebody is trying to take her stuff or somebody is trying in some way to take advantage of her. And she keeps going to this judge uh, asking for justice. And uh, the, the in the parable, it says that he he didn't either neither uh, he didn't he didn't know God or love God or care about people something like that. It, you know, his his view of God, his view of people, um, did not make him a very good judge. And yet, eventually, he he caves into her pressure. Um, but that's that's sort of the idea. That's sort of the picture you have of of people just coming uh, often at the city gates, maybe, and and coming in and asking for a decision, a verdict. Um, somebody is, um, somebody, a, a widow is, uh, is, is dealing with uh, somebody demanding her property, trying to hone in on her property. Uh, and, and so she can go to the, the judges and say, you know, give me justice. This guy's trying to take what belongs to me. Give me justice. Uh, ultimately, of course, it was the king who was supposed to ensure justice in Israel. Um, so obviously this is a system that can be exploited, right? And, and it was being exploited and, and God says, it's got to stop. Um, the needy are deprived of their, their rights in this picture. Uh, they're, they're innocent. Uh, the, uh, the, the innocents, uh, are, uh, are, are taken advantage of. They're not getting the, 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 the decision they should have. They're being trampled into dust. Um, the last clause that we read there literally is you push aside the way of the poor. Um, you're, you're the poor are coming, are trying to come for justice and you're, you're holding them at arm's length. You're pushing them aside. You're, you're holding them off. You're trying to keep, uh, keep them from getting what they, what they should have because the judges have already decided the case uh, for the wealthy. <clears throat> Still something we see in our world? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Too often. Sadly, it has not changed, has it? Still something we see. Still something we have to, as, as believers, uh, continually push back against. Because if we, if we get into stuff like that, if we just sort of let it go without at least marking it and noting it, um, then, then it becomes just sort of the air we breathe and it becomes something we, we can't get outraged about anymore and shocked about anymore. And that's perhaps a bad place for us to be. I mean, I think of the, the, the racial protests in our world and I think of the people who come and who, you know, who say for, you know, for years they haven't been treated right and their people haven't been treated right and you hear about some of the systemic practices that were uh, that were used against um, people of color and, and you you I mean, it, it's it's right here right this is it's just right out of this text <clears throat> it just shows that for all of our our technological progress and development human nature hasn't changed pretty much at all. I mean, I think that's true. I, I think that's, that's absolutely true. 
Yeah. All God has asked for through the ages is really even-handed treatment for the needy. It shouldn't be that big of a deal, but it is <laughs> going on today. It certainly, not, it, certainly, it should not be that big a deal among prosperous people. Right? <laughs> we ought to, that's something we ought to be able to get straight. Uh, uh, it's, 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 right. it's clear enough. It's something that, that as, as believers, we, we've got to take seriously. Uh, and, and we need to let it affect you know, the way we vote. We need to let it affect the, the way we serve in our communities. We, we need to let it affect the... the focus uh, of our of our concern as churches um. so then father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name they lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge in the house of their, of their god they drink wine taken as fines same girl stuff sounds really weird to us, I know. Uh, probably it's a reference to the, the sexual immorality laws of Leviticus 18. Uh, Leviticus 18 is one of those sections of the Bible, which if you read through it, you kind of tend to want to go, well, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's that section that says who you can and can't uh, have sexual relations with. And, and I mean, honestly, you read through it, you're like, well, <laughs> Who would want? To, who would? Who would think of that? You know, <laughs> that wouldn't occur to anybody, would it? Uh, consider we we live in this is a culture in which men often marry uh, more than once, uh, sometimes at the same time, um, and the 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 relational situations can get kind of kind of tricky, right? Um, so you know, your father marries somebody else and dies. And then now maybe you want to marry this other person. And Leviticus 18 says, no, you don't. You can't do that. Um, and so the, the sort of things that we go, well, well duh, uh, it kind of has to do with, with the way the culture was built and the way the culture was, was sort, of, um, sort of the way that, that marriage happened often. Um, but Leviticus 18 is very clear. There are some, some things that you don't do. And, and this kind of fits in the, in the broad category of Leviticus 18. There's not exactly a, a literal uh, parallel here, but, but it, it fits. Um, and and, and uh, it probably extends that Leviticus 18 prohibition. Um, might suggest there's some exploitation because it, because it comes right in the middle of these economic uh, issues, but um, it's hard to get that just from the language, so I, I'm not so sure about that. Um, the NIV actually says use, father and son use the same girl, and I can't find where that comes from. And literally, the word is they go to the same girl. They, 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 just, they go to the same girl. Um, and, and I'm not sure where use comes from in the NIV there. It's probably not a, a, a real great translation. Um, possible, too, that there's some sort of ritual uh, prostitution that's in view, but um, likely not. Uh, and anyway, anyway, in case, it's just another example of the way society has, as in Israel, has uh, has degenerated as even these these basic laws, this basic sort of decency of Leviticus 18. That's what Leviticus 18 is built around: the idea of decency, the idea of shame. There's just some things that 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 are shameful. Uh, it, it's essentially uh, uh, you you would put your father to shame if you were to do this, uh, and that's the big problem. Think about when uh, Absalom. Uh, uses David's concubines as sort of a prop in his, in his push for the, the kingdom. And, and, and you get the idea. It was a, a shameful thing, a way to just sort of you know, put, your, put, put, a, put, a, put your father to shame. It was um, like a capital, uh, a capital offense for things like that to uh, take place. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, it, was <laughs> it was pretty serious. It was it was something that God was pretty serious about. Um, like I said, there you can go back through Leviticus 18 if you want to, and 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 scan through there, and you'll see kind of the idea. Probably you'll catch the idea of 
uh, again, it's just another way of, of Amos saying, say, here's another place that you're violating the law. Here's another place that you're, you're consistently, willingly violating God's law. Uh, and then finally, they lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God, they drink wine taken as fines. Um, if it's not ritual prostitution, and I don't think it is, the idea here is from Exodus 22. Um, when, when you lend money, uh, to a, if you're an Israelite and you lend money to a needy Israelite, um, you don't treat it like a, a business deal. You don't charge interest. Um, and, and the text says, if you take your neighbor's cloak as a pledge, in other words, your neighbor says, here, I'll give you this cloak. This is a deposit. It's a pledge guaranteeing that I'm going to come back. I'm going to pay you what I owe. Uh, it says, if you do that, return it by sunset. It's just a symbolic act, right? Uh, he comes with his cloak. I don't know if maybe you could go get it again the next morning, but, but, but return it by sunset because that cloak is the only covering your neighbor has. What else can they sleep in? So the, the concern is, you know, you, you don't want to make your neighbor's situation more difficult. You, you want to you wanna watch out for them, even when they owe you money, even when they, they haven't paid you what they owe you yet. You don't want to, you, you don't, it's not compassionate, it's not right to make their situation worse by taking the only thing they have to wrap up in, right? I and mean, we, we have blankets all over our houses, so, uh, you know, it, we, we don't really understand that, but, but think about something of great value to you that you only have one of. Um, you take your neighbor's car in pledge, give it back, <laughs> um, because that might be the only way they can get around and get to their job and get to, to you know, do the things that they need to do to sustain their life. Um, and when they cry out to me, it says, I will hear, for I am compassionate. So they're laying down, they're, they're, you know, they're going to sleep in cloaks that they've, been, that they've taken from their neighbor as a pledge that they should have given back. They're drinking wine that they've taken as fines from their neighbor, probably an extension of the principle. Wine wasn't really a luxury item. Wine was a necessity. So they're, they're taking this stuff from their neighbor. Uh, as a pledge or as a fine uh, for, for the money that's owed them. Uh, and they're doing it where? Probably not literally, but where are they doing it in the text? The, the temple. Yeah, they're lying down beside every altar and they're drinking wine in the house of their, of their God. Um, I don't think he's saying that's literally happening. I think he's saying I mean, why would you go sleep in the temple in your cloak that you take took as pledge? I, I think he's literally, I think he's saying they're they're you know they're going to the temple and they're they're going through the motions of, of religion, and yet they're doing these things to each other, and it's inconsistent, it's not right, it shouldn't happen. Um they're 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 going and going through the religious motions, but they're violating God's compassion for the poor as they're doing it. <clears throat> House of their God probably refers to the, uh, the temples of the Lord at, at Dan and Bethel, uh, though it's interesting, the house of their God <laughs> kind of makes it seem like God is distancing himself. I don't, I don't know what God they're serving, but it's not me. It's not my house, not anymore. Uh, comments, thoughts. You get the idea, right? Uh, they're, they're, they're doing these things. They're violating God's law in all these ways, and yet they're still going to the altar. They're still going to the house of God. They're still going through the motions. Now, Pastor, when you said earlier that he had um, two girlfriends, or I mean two women, that sounds like polygamous to me uh well yeah polygamy actually was allowed in the old testament uh it was something that israel practiced uh in the old testament this is it's it's kind of related but um but it, but polygamy was allowed but but these all of these things that he mentions here in this chapter uh you can go to the old testament you can go to exodus you can go to numbers you can go to leviticus you can go to Deuteronomy. You can you can look through and you can see uh, these places where what what Israel is doing is violating the law, violating what God okay. says they should do. 
You can read a lot about it in Leviticus uh, 20. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes, Leviticus 20 as well. Um, you know, it just reminds me of how easy it is to develop these these lives that we compartmentalize, that we put into little boxes. This is my church life, and this is my work life, and this is my home life. And, and they don't have anything to do with each other sometimes. They don't relate very well to one another. Um, we don't make our decisions in one place. We don't, we don't make our work decisions based on our faith, or we don't make our, uh, our home decisions based on our faith. It's, we, we sort of, we can easily keep our lives separated like these little boxes on our screens right now right we can we can keep our lives into those in those neat little boxes and and so we wind up in one part of our life doing things that quite obviously <laughs> uh, don't please God uh, and yet we can still go on our in our church lives and 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 kind of not think about it kind of separate the two that's a very common uh, criticism that I've heard of from people who who don't say that, oh, well, they don't like organized religion because there are so many hypocrites. You know, they, they go to church and they're, you know, they're worshiping God and, you know, acting, you know, so pious and everything. But then, uh, you know, they go out the rest of the week in their businesses and they're they're cheating people and, and you know, doing things that, that they shouldn't be doing. And so, you know, why, why should I go to church um, and, you know, and be around all these hypocrites? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it is a criticism. And sometimes it's unfair and, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's deserved. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the things we've got to ask is uh, how do I... Yeah, I'm, I'm at church on Sunday, but how the rest of the week? In what ways might I be contributing to the injustice and the immorality in our world um, without, you know, without living it, without giving it much thought, without giving it much consideration? <clears throat> so from here, you expect the, with the pattern uh, uh, fire on the battlements, right? But instead. God reminds the people of his acts of salvation. He says, yet I destroyed the Amorites before them, um, though they were as tall as the cedars and strong as the oaks. Uh, when, did they, when did God destroy the Amorites before them? Well, you keep reading, I destroyed their fruit above and their roots below. I brought you up out of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness to give you the land of the Amorites. I uh, Kind of using the Amorites as shorthand, I think, for all the tribes. There were lots of tribes in the Promised Land at the time. Amorites were one of them. They were probably a dominant one at the time of the, the exodus and the entrance into the Promised Land. Um, they weren't the only one. But, uh, but then uh, in, 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 uh, in Deuteronomy and Joshua and some in Numbers, most of the references are to the Amorites, not to all those other tribes. So maybe there was some sort of shift in power uh, that the Amorites were the, the, the main tribe. But in any case, it, it's a reference to the, the people that lived in the promised land that God uh, allowed Israel to subdue. Remember uh, in Numbers 13, the spies come back. We're like grasshoppers in front of these people. Um, maybe some hyperbole, but, Am but Amos sort of... Uh, uh, plugs into that hyperbole here. They were they were as tall as cedars, you thought, and yet God God dealt with them and uh, and and gave you this land. And He says, "I also raised up prophets from among your children and Nazarites from among your youths." Uh, is this not true, people of Israel? Declares the Lord. Samson was a Nazarite, right? A, a special vow, a special devotee to God. So God raised up these. Uh, these special people through whom he revealed himself and, and let Israel know more about him. Um, but what happened? Well, you made the Nazarites drink wine. They couldn't do that. You made the Nazarites drink wine. You commanded the prophets not to prophesy. Now then I'll crush you as a cart crushes when loaded with grain. The swift will not escape. The strong will not muster their strength and the warrior won't save his life. The archer will not stand his ground. The fleet-footed soldier will not get away. 
and the horseman will not save his life. Even the bravest warriors will flee naked on that day, declares the Lord. So what's the picture? What's the judgment to come? What's it, what's it going to look like for Israel? Good. Sorry. Not good. Not, not good. <laughs> for sure. Not good. Kind of like what Israel did to the original inhabitants of the promised land. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even more so because Israel, Israel didn't drive them all out. Right? Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it seems like it's a total loss. Um, nobody is going to get away. Nobody's going to survive. All the army is going to be wiped away. And, and uh, you know, this, this total um, destruction as a people uh, is coming. And we know that that's what happened with Assyria. <clears throat> a few texts came to mind as I was reading this. These, you know, these, these, these words of judgment against people who would have called themselves the people of God. Um, Hebrews twelve twenty five. If they did not escape when they refused Him who warned them on earth. How much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? And then if, uh, Hebrews 2, 1 through 3. We must pay the, care, pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we've heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? I was struck by God telling Israel in the place where in the previous judgments um, you had the fire on the battlements, God pauses and says, let me remind you how I saved you. Let me tell you again what I did for you. And as believers in a greater salvation than that, um, you know, we, we've got to listen. We've got to pay attention. We've got to hear and we've got to live our lives in response and, and gratitude to that salvation for that salvation. And then first Peter four seventeen, Peter um, kind of puts the, the suffering of Christians in his day. in in this context, it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. Peter's, Peter's effect says, maybe what you're going through is, is the judgment coming. God, God, um, God judging and, and purifying, not, not to destroy, not to wipe away, but to, to, uh, to, to purify you, to, to strengthen you, to test you, to make you strong. And, uh, and, and he, so he says, if you suffer, suffer as a Christian, suffer, <laughs> suffer as a, as a believer and praise God that you bear that name. I talked a lot tonight. Sorry, next week you'll talk more. Uh, what what, uh, what thoughts do you have as we wind things up? Comments? Well, I don't want to pick on teenagers or anything, but you could make a uh, <laughs> uh, example here. You know how teenager, teenagers sometimes stubbornly resist what their parents are trying to tell them. You know, they're trying to steer them in the right direction, and they just don't want to do it. And that's kind of how Israel was. They're just being very stubborn and not listening to good advice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. Their, 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 their stubborn resistance to God's revelation. I mean, God has, has revealed himself over and over uh, to Israel, right? Through the ex well, through the law, God has over and over shown himself, you know, and, and, um, and, and Israel has refused. This wasn't a snap judgment God made, right? This isn't God flying off the handle one day. This is Israel's settled rebellion and God's response to that. No, he's been trying to reach him for years, you know. It's like a parent is long suffering, you know. Yeah. But sometimes uh, things come to a head and a line is drawn. Any other thoughts?
Well, thanks very much. Hope you guys have a good week. It's always a pleasure to see you all and get to be with you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. All right. You guys have a great week. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, Laura. John. Have a good one out there. Be careful. You too. Have a nice trip, then. You'll see. Thank you.